Well, I'm here today with John McConnell. John uh, is a guy who knows radio and audio and entertainment and talent really, really well. And so we have lots to chat about today. John, I understand that you're uh, now a resident of Florida in Vero Beach, formerly the home of the Dodgers during spring training, but a bunch of beautiful communities. Are mostly uh, Northeasterners down there, or do you have a smattering of uh, Midwesterners too? Yeah, I would say it, it, it feels like most of the people uh, that we have met are from the Northeast, certainly Chicago, part of the Midwest. But yeah, we have a my wife and I have a place over on the other side of the state in Naples, Florida, and there it's mostly Midwesterners. And as I say to uh, friends from uh, up here, this a bunch of East Coasters, too, but predominantly wonderful Midwesterners. And uh, I have friends up here, they're so strange. Uh, my wife and on a beach like you are, and we love to walk the beach on the Gulf. And uh, I tell friends up here, th these people are so strange that when they walk past you, they say hello and good morning. <laughs> well, actually, I think that's a misnomer because I've always found New Yorkers to be pretty friendly bunch. You know, I, th I think, I don't know. I've been, uh, I'm, I, I get up to New York a lot now, and maybe I'm just happy to be there. But uh, Well, but now that you say it, I was on the subway uh, the other night, and the guy next to me put his head on my shoulder. So, yeah, I guess I guess we're friendly up here. <laughs> so, John, uh, tell me, how did you how did you get started in uh, in the entertainment industry and in particular the radio side of things? I actually got interested in media and radio specifically when I was in high school. Where was that? It was in San Francisco. I was uh, born in L.A. but raised in San Francisco, even though I went to uh, college back in L.A. And in the 10th grade, uh, I made a friend, Terry McElhen. And Terry uh, ended up becoming my best friend. In fact, we were in a, we were in a football uh, game. A, uh, um, you know, the guys put together during uh, recess or lunch. And we actually got into it uh, over a ball. And we came up kind of laughing. What are we doing here? And <laughs> fell over a stupid ball. And... Uh, and we became fast friends. And um, as often as the case, when you grow up, you see what your friend's parents do. And I had friends that did everything. Uh, our next door neighbor, he was a carpenter. Uh, the other next door neighbor was a businessman. Next to him was a doctor. But Terry's dad was Dave McElhead. And Dave was the morning radio host on KCBS AM in san francisco and at the time he was the number one or number two rated radio host in the, in the san francisco bay area wow and he was such a good guy he was so nice and i quickly kind of was it was attracted to all it was that he did and the family they were very outgoing and so dave uh one day uh asked me if i wanted to go to work with him and which during high school became a fairly regular thing. I would have to meet him at his garage door at quarter to five, four forty-five in the morning. Wow! Uh, and, and the uh, and the and the garage door would open up automatically because he'd be coming out the other side. And I'd catch a ride and go to the radio station, and I absolutely fell in love with it. And no kidding. And, and, and never, you know. I mean, I did have dreams of, of being a professional tennis player, but I didn't quite get there. But my passion for uh, radio and broadcasting at the time was, uh, I mean, it was just so nurtured by Dave. And he was a great mentor, a great mentor. And I, and I, and I got into the business in a big way after that. So that was while you were in high school. And then where did you go to college? Uh, so college, I did, uh, 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 I did a short stint at City College in San Francisco, but uh, in my sophomore year, um, I got a scholarship to Pepperdine University in Malibu. It was a brand new campus. Um, we, um, I had been looking for colleges that would provide scholarships, athletic scholarship, scholarships, because I was a trying to become an accomplished tennis player at the time. And I was looking at Arizona and TCU and other universities and uh, Pepperdine came along and I got a look at the campus and I'm like, okay, you know what? You don't have to beat me over the head very far, very, very long and far to know that, you know, Pepperdine just might be the most perfect uh, location. It is incredible, John. I remember uh, being out West with my two sons, 
uh, who had already started college, and we went and looked at Pepperdine, and they said to me, why didn't you tell us we <laughs> might have been better students? As you say, it's just a perfect spot. And for a tennis player, it's got to be uh, Nirvana. Oh, it, it was unbelievable. They were very, very smart and very strategic. Um, and I'm sure they, they still are in terms of an administration. When they moved the campus, which was right next to USC, uh, near downtown Los Angeles, their strategy was to start by funding the athletic program, uh, the religious, uh, the religion program, and a couple of other things after that. But by focusing first on the athletic program, they brought in baseball players, volleyball players, basketball players. And within several years, and we were a D1 school, we had top 10 teams in all sports. And wow. that brought a great deal of, yeah, it's a, it's a story that, that's not well, well known. It's a good marketing story. Yeah, it brought in a lot of uh, notoriety, a lot of a lot of money, and I had understood for years that they had the largest endowment of any uh, 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 religious school uh, university in the country. I don't know where it is today, but no, it was very smart. It was well done, and it was a great experience. Did you pursue a tennis career after college? No, I, I actually I wanted uh, I in college I tried I was. Uh, played my sophomore year and my junior year. And my senior year um, actually had decided, uh, working with a coach, to redshirt my senior year and travel, play tournaments, go around the country, around the world, get better, come back, have a good senior year, maybe a great senior year, and possibly break through. I was getting close on some big matches, but wasn't quite, uh, quite finishing them off. And just about the time I got ready to leave in August, would have been August of 1975, uh, I was training and practicing and I slipped and broke my foot on the court. And so that wiped out any chance of traveling that next year, certainly not playing on the team because at that point all the, all the spots had been committed. So I jumped back in. I mean, I was in it, you know, certainly during my studies. I, I jumped back in uh, to academics, really focused on it. I got an internship in my senior year uh, at a local radio station in Los Angeles. That was fantastic experience. Um, after that internship, I got hired, and, and I just I went from there. So I think it was a matter of luck. I mean, you know. <laughs> I might have been a, a, a fair a fair tennis player, but uh, but that experience was just it was it was pretty neat, eye opening. Uh, I worked on the Paramount lot in Los Angeles, which, by the way, is now where my youngest son works. No kidding, it all comes around. Well, I, that story is one of resilience, and and resilience is a a common theme in your life, John. Uh, we'll we'll touch on so many more points, but take us through your career now. You, uh, you you've been uh, on the talent side of things. You've been talent. You've managed talent. You've coached talent. Uh, you've uh, managed uh, uh, big networks, big properties. I know at one time you uh, ran Westwood One. Uh, what uh, what do you make of the the industry today? Uh, certainly, uh, uh, just in the last. Uh, uh, last half a dozen years, I'd say, uh, podcasting has come into its own. Uh, there are so many uh, good podcasts out there, so much great content. It's been small democratized in such a big way. Yet, uh, if I listen to uh, people who know the world like you do, or another friend of mine, uh, Bob Pittman, who uh, will recite how uh, radio is still the medium that attracts the most uh, interactions to most people on a weekly basis and people think it goes over, but there's still tens, if not hundreds of millions of people who listen to radio every week. Yeah, no, that, that, that's absolutely true. Radio is still the most consumed media uh, today and there are no fewer radio stations um, and radio at audio has gone through a transformation the last six to 10 years. When satellite radio uh, was introduced, the radio industry looked at that as a uh, as a one of the original audio disruptors. 
um, fearful that uh, possibly it would take away from the radio, the traditional terrestrial radio listening base. But um, the operators were very smart. Both F uh, Sirius and XM were separate at the time. They eventually came together. But I think what it did was it showed that audio programming could be presented and consumed in a very big way, differently than was being consumed on the radio side. It was commercial free for music. Uh, they actually hired different kinds of personalities on the talk side. But that was the beginning of the digital revolution uh, on, on the audio side. And then when podcasting started, it really... Uh, um, you know, I, I equate podcasting to what happened in television with cable. As cable started, you know, it made a big difference relative to the uh, to the network space. And Plus, there's, uh, there's other competition for our bandwidth of our ears, yeah. and that's mm -hmm. things like uh, books on tape and uh, uh, all the other uh, training and educational and entertainment kinds of properties on recorded form pre-podcast. Uh, I know... Uh, I'm a consumer of uh, audible content, uh, books, uh, uh, of books in every other kind of form. But in fact, if I was sit in my car and not have something on, it would be very uncomfortable. <laughs> That's a dog barking in the back. <laughs> yeah, no, and and I and I think you know that that's the beauty of, of audio today. You don't have to be in a fixed position. You can be traveling. You can be moving a great deal on the radio side uh most of the consumption of radio and listening is in car still is in car and more and more it's podcasting as well but i think podcasting has done you know um i mean i just i'm, I'm very grateful that uh, something new was introduced to the audio industry at this stage who knows where we'll be uh what ai potentially will do in terms of usage and and consumption habits uh, going forward, but they're still growing medias, and uh, we'll see what the change looks like uh, 10 years from now. You know, you, you don't sit down for dinner or for a drink at a cocktail party with somebody that it doesn't frequently turn into a conversation of, what are you watching? Mm -hmm. And that's in terms of uh, 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 recorded programming on Netflix or uh, Prime or wherever you, you view things. Uh, what are you listening to? in terms of books or reading in books, listening to books. More and more I find people are listening uh, to books because they're not just read anymore. They're, they're genuinely performed. And uh, and what do you listen to in terms of podcasts? Anything interesting? Yeah. Any, any interesting people? And that's a frequent conversation. I bet you're involved in those too. Yeah, no, it's it's great. Uh, and the biggest difference being, of course, that, you know, as opposed to listening to radio or watching network TV or cable TV, with podcasting, well, you can certainly do it on television as well. But with podcasting, you consume it, you listen to it when you want to do it, and that and that makes that makes a big difference for people. You know, as as people move around, we have a lot of choices. The choice has to fit for me. And how do you spend your time now, professionally? I left uh, ABC Radio in, at the end of two thousand eight. Uh, that was the downturn, as you well know. We had been going through a, uh, a slide. Uh, in the you know, in our economy for a couple of years at that point, uh, we had we had actually seen the signal in media between newspapers and magazine ad sales and radio back in 2006. And I left ABC at the end of 2008. They graciously bought out my uh, my contract, and I started my own business. Uh, I thought about going to work for another company. Uh, I was head of programming for the ABC radio division, but I started my own business. Um, it was uh, consulting. My first client was uh, was Elvis Duran, uh, his agent, his talent agent, uh, David Katz, and I helped to uh, strategize uh, their network uh, and syndication expansion. Uh, I did work for Harpo and the audio division, and... Um, I, uh, um, I had identified Mike Huckabee uh, in the conservative audio space as being the, an heir apparent to Paul Harvey. Uh, I worked very closely with Paul for what, almost 20 years. I was a big fan. Yeah, yeah, Paul, wonderful. And, uh, and you know, worked to, get, you know, worked to get him in position. 
And then over time, what had happened was people were reaching out to me to have me negotiate their personal services agreements, their talent agreements, because they knew that I had come from the business side. And it wasn't something that I had actually naturally intended to do, but within, uh, within about six months, I had done uh, two of the, the major voices on WCBS uh, AM. And within several years, uh, I believe it's now been, uh, well, it would be 11 years ago, I decided, I left in 2008, 11 years ago, I decided that uh, representing talent was what I wanted to do full time, not necessarily consulting. Of representing talent. I always felt sometimes people are taken advantage of. Um, I saw the industry from both sides, from the talent side, and what they needed and should, you know, deserve based on, you know, what they brought to the table. I also saw the company side and how they view things and what they thought was fair. And I saw how the economics worked. And it was the one thing that in doing and being a talent agent that brought me closer to talent who I fundamentally love. And so I became an agent and uh, I still do it today. That's good. And uh, how do you find talent now? Do you find new talent or you're primarily working with well-established talent? You mentioned you saw uh, Mike Huckabee as an heir to Paul Harvey. Did you seek him out? Did he seek you out? Um, when uh, when uh, uh, Mike happened, um, we sought him out. Uh, after the presidential run, uh, based on, uh, as we did at the time, Mitt Romney, um, uh, because they were, they fit a little bit more to, you know, Paul's, it's hard, hard to figure <laughs> what, where Paul's posit, uh, uh, politics were. Yep. Um, but it, if he was, um, he was a traditionalist and, um, at the time, those two uh, uh, felt like the most articulate from that side of the, you know, the political fence. Um, and uh, um, over time, it, we just felt that uh, uh, govern, the governor, Huckabee, uh, given his radio experience and his media experience, would be, would be best at it. Today, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in a position that I, I don't... Um, actively although i did identify uh, somebody a month ago i don't actively uh, uh seek out uh, uh new people um they usually find us through uh current clients or recommendations or word of mouth at my age i don't need to grow exponentially i'm in a good place <laughs> <laughs> and uh, did uh, uh, john did rush limbaugh change the uh, radio landscape oh no doubt oh no doubt um, I think Rush in, in, a, in a very big way. Um, Rush uh, took the position that uh, listeners uh, were not, from his side of the political fence, were not being well served and that there were not um, um, uh, choices and outlets for uh, people of his position. Um, take that, with, which was true, uh, they were not being well served, um, and take that with his giant sized sense of humor and his master of, of the English language, um, and his ability to, you know, with that sense of humor to poke fun at people. And but he very much changed uh, the talk radio business. Um, as a result of Rush entering the space. See, most radio stations, successful news talk and talk radio stations, uh, had people of both points of view, uh, yes. uh, on the left and on the right, and usually pretty big news departments. But as Rush continued to grow, and then when we put Sean Hannity on the air, um, you now had six that hours. That was at ABC? Of, yeah, that was at ABC. Uh, we did that... Uh, um, I think we hired Sean back in 1998 uh, or 97 uh, locally on WABC mm -hmm. and then put him into syndication. That was at night and moved him up to, to dayside. And then the day before 9-11 in New York, we actually put him into national syndication. 
So once you had Rush and Sean and then Glenn Beck, now nine hours a day, the industry took that as, well, maybe if we program that side of the political fence full time, we can make entire radio stations um, uh, not very expensively. It was that reason. Wow. Yeah, no, that was it. That was exactly it. That, uh, uh, that, and then the new cable channel called Fox News came into play. And yep. there was more sort of... I think I've heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> there was more and more effort to uh, bifurcate, you know, general media users. And, and the big news today, that. John, is that Rupert Murdoch stepping down as a young man, 92 years old. He's got so much gas left in the tank. How could he consider retiring? I don't know why. It's been, you know, it's, it's probably been a big year. <laughs> I tell you, I, he, he still looks terrific, I think. Yeah, yeah. I have a great Rupert Murdoch story, if I may. Sure, I'd love a great so, Rupert Murdoch story. So, ni- 1976, uh, 1977, I just graduated college. I got four different jobs right after Pepperdine. And one of them was uh, being a messenger for a magazine in Los Angeles, New West Magazine, that he had just bought, that he had just bought. And one day I came in, all right, where am I going this morning? Where are my uh, pickups? And said, go pick up the new boss. He's at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Rolled up in my 1965 green Volkswagen. (laughs) Uh, And you can see just, you know, the... uh, the, the guys, you know, <laughs> valets see me coming like, no, 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 you don't belong here. <laughs> don't even slow down here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I pulled up, got out of the here. I'm here to pick up Mr. Murdoch. And I can, he was over there and he came forward. He sort of looks at me, looks at the car, looks at me. He goes, sir, I'm here to pay, take you to the magazine. And uh, get out, open the door for him, put him in the car. And he asked me 20 questions about my business, about what I was doing, about this and that. I never got a chance to ask. I don't think I asked him anything. But in the you know 10 minutes of driving him uh, across town to, to his, uh, his new magazine, uh, I had uh, an experience that I will, I've, uh, all these years later, 1977, I still don't forget it. <laughs> That's a good one. I, I, I just wish there was a picture of him looking at you, looking at the car behind you. <laughs> he knew they weren't overspending on transportation at the magazine. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, he, asked, he asked me, what did I make? I said, well, I've got an hourly rate, plus I have a mileage rate. And he sort of figures it out. And then, you know, do you only do the morning? So, you know, I, you know, every time there's a close, I have to be available. It was, it was great. What was the best job you've had besides today? Best job you've had in radio? When the radio market was really booming, you're running a business that uh, you really have your teeth sunk into. What, what was that? Yeah, I, you know, I think it was probably two two jobs that I look back, you know, most favorably. The first one was being news director and then program director for KGO Radio in San Francisco. Uh, we were in New York. Uh, I had been working for NBC and then WOR Radio and an opportunity came up in San Francisco to be the news director for KGO, which was the number one news talk radio station in the country. Uh, it had fabulous ratings. It had a 20-person news department for a radio station. Wow. And uh, they had the wherewithal to cover international news if something broke that was so significant. And I said to Marie that, you know, this is the job that will, if I go for a few years, that will get me the big job back in New York. And I left in 1989, went out to become news director two years later, become program director two years later after that, uh, the big job in New York, the vice president of news for ABC Audio uh, came available and we came back to New York. And I love that. I love that job because there was, n- there was nothing we couldn't do. Um, we covered the world. Uh, we we covered the news locally. Uh, when I got there, I mean, I had only been there a few minutes or three months when we had the uh, earthquake in San Francisco during the World Series. I was at the World Series. I was trying to recruit a new business reporter, and I took her to the, hey, want to go to the World Series? 
and uh, and and we had the the earthquake, and all eyes were obviously on the ABC flagship station. Um, and then um, after, uh, in 1993, was uh, given the opportunity to come back and run ABC News, and that was also amazing. Tremendous resources. Paul, did Hart. you just feel like you were at the center of the universe? Then, yeah, I, I it, in every single way. Yeah, uh, we had. Like I said, Paul Harvey, we had this huge news department of 2,500 radio stations. Uh, We were getting into the sports business and and just launched ESPN programming, ESPN radio programming on the weekend. The music programming was was being expanded, you know, uh, largely due to the fact that we had so much, so much business in Paul Harvey. Um, that we needed to expand in order to sort of flatten it out, if you will. And, and the company got into urban programming and, you know, all different kinds of uh, country programming and really expanded it. And that was, that was a wonderful job. And I was, you know, I was there in New York from 90 in, in one position or another, and then leading, uh, leading that division uh, from, uh, from 1993 until 2008. Was there a time we were neighbors in Manhasset? Well, we probably were. We were in Manhasset for 25 years. We lived in Muncie Park. Uh huh. We bought the house, uh, moved in uh, April 15th, 1994. It was snowing. We live right behind your uh, new uh, executive within your organization, sharing a backyard with... Uh, with the uh, with the Fortes, we moved in in 1994, and we were there 25 years, and we loved it. We loved being. Uh, there. It must have been hell living behind the Fortes, though. I mean, the parties, the pigs being roasted. It was just <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah all the time. <laughs> it was it, it was pretty wild. We cut we cut a path between the two houses. We didn't have a fence in the backyard. <laughs> and. Uh, I know, John, that you have other passions besides your your professional life and your listening life. But before we move on to that, besides this podcast, what do you find yourself? What do you what do you listen to? What do you sample? Anything you go to regularly in terms of podcast land? Yeah, um, mostly I love I love news podcasts. I love I love, uh, um, you know, I I listen to a lot of the Wall Street Journal Um listen to the New York Times. I listen. Um, I, I, I really tend to, to always want the latest information. Obviously, I had a career in the news business and journalism, and, and that was important to me. Um, so that is, that is primarily what I do. Uh, you know, I do listen to podcasts of clients, and, uh, yep. and I, re- I represent individuals on both sides of the, of, of the political fence. But generally speaking, I go to my go-to is is live news. Yep, and I and I love now if I see an article in a, a journal in the morning or the Times, and I can uh, click the button, and when I hop in the car, I can listen to that story on the way to the office. I I just think that's great. I got to tell you a quick story. It was back in March, uh, at uh, 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 Worth Media Group, Worth Magazine. Uh, they were putting on a, co- a conference, a, a women's conference, and I was opening the conference with some remarks. And I convinced my adult daughter, uh, my oldest a child, who also lives in Manhasset, I convinced her to let my 14-year-old granddaughter, the oldest, take the day off from school and come with me to the conference because there were going to be so many terrific women there. Uh, it's a conference. I try and hold it to 100 people, but uh, it was out of control. It got to about 220 and we had some really terrific speakers. And I thought, what an education for my 14-year-old granddaughter to come and meet some of these people, listen to them, spend the day. So my wife decided to come, my daughter came, and my granddaughter. So the four of us sitting, uh, it was over in Hudson Yards on the west side of Manhattan. And uh, the best way to get in is on the, the uh, Long Island Railroad, which you were, I'm sure, a frequent user of. Yep. Uh, so we went to Penn Station, walked to two blocks over to Hudson Yard, and my, we're sitting facing one another, my wife and I facing my daughter and my granddaughter, who's named Abby. Mm-hmm. And she looked at me, she says, Papa, I've never seen anybody read a newspaper before. Oh, gosh. Oh, God. I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, my dad reads it on his phone. And I, I never travel on the, the subway or the, the, uh, the Long Island Railroad. 
And here, you and all these other people, I had the journal that I picked up off the driveway. He says, you and all these other people read the newspaper. I've never seen that before. <laughs> and, and that's when I realized, oh, Lord, things are changing. Yeah, no, in, in, in a big way. I tell you, I still, I don't get the newspaper every day, but I do get it on the weekend. And I do look forward to it. Yeah, me too. Uh, so uh, the other passion that I know about in your life is you have an interest in uh in uh, spinal cord injuries, brain injuries, and uh, and what's uh, what what goes on there? How did you develop that interest, John? And then I'd love to hear what you think about what's going in the world, going on in the world of treatment and research there. But how did how did this become uh, a passion? Sure. So in uh, in two thousand five, uh, in November two thousand five, early November, I came uh, I came home very late uh, on a on a Friday night. Um, the, uh, I had just hired uh, a, new, a new person, a new talent at ABC. Uh, for country music fans, uh, they know Brooks and Dunn and Kix Brooks. Uh, Kix Brooks became the new host of American Country Countdown. He was, uh, he was also president at the time of the Country Music Awards, and he decided that that year uh, the awards should be in New York City. And so he was now already on the air came to New York, and uh, basically I got introduced to uh, four days of a lot of entertaining, so we said a lot, a, a lot of parties, and I came home super late. Uh, you saying these country people can party? <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> they, they introduced me. Why do you guys drink clear, clear liquids, you know, vodka, tequila? Well, fewer calories. <laughs> Anyway, I had a, a, a couple of guys that I used to meet uh, every Saturday morning. We'd go for a bike ride and a run. And I woke up in a start. I was late uh, uh, that morning. I'd overslept a bit. And uh, in my hurry um, to find my running shoes, get on my bike to meet my friends, I, uh, I, I could not find my little backpack for my running shoes. So... I got on the bike and I tied my running shoes together. You know how you've seen, you know, shoes, tennis shoes t tied together at the laces, thrown over uh, wires, that kind of thing. Power cable, sure. Yeah. And so here's the here's the bar, the the bar on the bike. Here are the handlebars. Here's the bar, and I draped the two running shoes over the crossbar of the bike. And about ten minutes in, uh, a few minutes away from meeting my my friends. Um, one of the shoes uh, was getting close to the front fork and I reached over to grab the shoe to pull it back. And what I ended up doing is mistakenly, stupidly, I pushed the shoe into the front tire. It got stuck in the fork and I went flying. Do you have a helmet on? I had a helmet on and that helmet saved my life. In fact, wow. Um, when I when I landed, I landed kind of on the right side of my head. When you look at the helmet from the inside, and you always wonder well, why are why are helmets shaped that way? Why are they constructed that way? Well, those things that come together like this are actually stress points, and every one of the stress points in the helmet was cracked. Mm. And and there was a big so skid. They absorbed on a lot of shock as they were designed everything, to do. Everything. Everything. And I hit the ground, and um, I couldn't move. I was I was a bit, you know, on my on my right side, facing like this, and I couldn't feel anything except what felt like a sledgehammer had hit me on the back of my neck. And I had no feeling other than that, except my little pinky on my right side, uh, and I could. A little bit, I could feel my small toe on the, on the left side. I looked back, and uh, I could see the road behind me, and I could see a car coming up and not being able to move. I said, well, shoot. <laughs> this, is, this is how it's going to be. And very fortunate, uh, the car stopped. The guy walked out. I remember... He had on brand new tennis shoes and wearing blue jeans. And he walked up to me. Uh, he said, are you okay? And I said, no, I can't move. Uh, I, was, I was able to speak. Uh, uh, 
he said, what can I do? And I said, call 911. There's actually a police officer up the road. I just, I just went by him. And then he goes, John McConnell? <laughs> and I said, yes. He goes, it's Alan, Bob's friend. And I'm like, oh, how are you? <laughs> I said, <laughs> and he said, better than you, I think. Um, and then he made some sort of comment about not being able to beat me in tennis even then. And I chuckled and laughed and it kind of took some stress off. I said, you know, Alan, call, call 911. And uh, fast forward to the hospital. What I'm going over, what I'm glossing over is the moments of understanding and appreciating what and, and for a very short period of time, what paralysis actually would mean to people. I thought about, you know, not being able to walk, not being able to hug and kiss my kids, not being able to hold my wife at all, not being able to go to the bathroom, take care of yourself. Everything came rushing in, and it continued to do over the next several hours because I had no movement. They got me to the hospital. Um, they, uh, they, um, I started to get a little movement back. Uh, North Shore, I assume. I was at North Shore. I was at North Shore. And I was, again, fast forwarding, I was blessed by the orthopedic surgeon who was on call, who, um, after all the others said, you know, we have to prepare him for surgery, we have to do this and that. The orthopedic uh, uh, surgeon on call. Uh, Jeffrey, Dr. Jeff, uh, said, I don't know if anybody, any emergency room doctor would ever make this decision, but I'm not going to operate on you in the short run. I'm going to let you sit for a few more hours. Uh, they, they even decided that they're not going to, they didn't put me in a cage. They didn't put me in the, in the, in the queue. But they had me in a, in a full body brace. Said, just don't move. Just sit. Be calm. Let's sit. Let's see how you do. And over the next several hours into the evening, he kept checking on me. And, uh, and the next morning, uh, he came in. Uh, how was your mom? And he said to me, I'm going to tell you something that no doctor would ever say. I'm not going to operate. I think you are the luckiest patient I have ever seen. Because there I was with not only an inflamed spinal cord, but I had cracked the top two vertebrae in my neck clean through. Wow. But they were done C1 and C2. But the breaks were in such a way that he didn't feel that, he felt that by staying still that I wouldn't be in jeopardy. And um, he thought that they would heal uh, uh, successfully without any sort of intervention. And um, honest to God, I was I was released a few days later, and I was walking a week later. And you know that decision by him, um, you know, probably saved the quality of my life, you know, forever. Wow! Wow! And you know, and behaviorally. Uh Look, doctors first uh, sign a Hippocratic Oath, yeah. take a, a Hippocratic Oath. And, but behaviorally, they get paid to do stuff. Mm -hmm. So the, the oh. over, overwhelming uh, behavioral imperatives for them would be to do what they are trained to do, surgery. Mm -hmm. But here's someone who, uh, thinking about his oath and thinking about why he went into medicine, which is to help people in the best way he could, decided that what he'd get paid for isn't what he should do. That's that's remarkable, and, and wow, what a testament to uh, him. What good fortune. Yeah, it, Dr. Dr. Jeff Silver is his name. He's there in, he's there in Great Neck, and uh, when I uh, was in 2019 honored by the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation, I'll get to that. Uh, he, he came, he was there with his wife, and, uh, and uh, very still very grateful to thank him. So, so tell us about how you got involved with the Christopher Reeve Foundation. So in April, this is now almost six months later, still very much in a brace. I'm reading an article Sunday morning about the foundation. Chris had passed away. Dana was sick. 
that told the story of how the foundation had come together with uh, the original founders and, 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 and how he got involved. Uh, and at the end of the article, it said that uh, they were recruiting uh, participants for the 2006 marathon in New York City. And I, I get to the end of it, and, you know, with those same buddies that I told you about meeting for a walk and a run, we had always talked about doing a marathon together. And, of course, the, light, the, you know, the light bulb went off, and I'm like, that's it. That's my goal. I'm going to work towards doing the 2006 marathon because it was essentially a year and a couple of days from the anniversary of having my accident. So I called my wife, Marie, into the room. I said, I mean, this, look, God, this is, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I can't tell you, even though this is podcasting, what she sent, what she said to me about my, you know, great big idea. How often do you, because of your work, uh, I, I have a younger brother who had a, 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 a bad bike accident, not as serious as yours, but serious nonetheless, about five years ago. And they broke both collarbones. Fortunately, he had his helmet on, and it split in half too. So he had a concussion, broken collarbones, broken ribs. But how often do you hear of people having bike accidents? No, all the time, all the time. And and the bike accidents aren't 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 generally the 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 road warriors who are out there for forty, fifty, a hundred mile rides. The, there's it's a mom or a dad or a, or a child that's a few minutes away or down the block from the house that got on the bike and thought, no big deal. You know, I don't need my helmet. And it's, it's like, the, you know, that that's where so much of it happens and not wearing a helmet. I mean, I would never think of, of, uh, of not wearing a helmet. And I tell you what, that helmet that I gave to the bike shop, the local bike shop in Port Washington at the time, he sold a lot of helmets when people came in to buy a new bike and so well and let me saw see that that. Hang there. so i saw the the story about the foundation i called my buddies all of a sudden everybody's in to do the marathon um i'd also reached out to the foundation for some resources and information and i talked to them got involved um said to them what do you think about the idea of a guy breaks his neck does the new york marathon a year later, can we can we get in and, and raise funds on your behalf? And um, it became a lifelong partnership and love. I got involved in 2008 or 2006. I'm still very committed to the foundation. I'm the national vice, vice chair. I'm going to do the marathon again this year, my ninth on uh, behalf of the foundation. Well, that's terrific. In New York, and I'm still, yeah, still extremely involved. John, what is the work of the foundation now? So it, it's it's really twofold. It's it's uh, the mission is all about care and cure. We are very committed to running a um, a resource center, um, in part funded by the government, but a national resource center for those who are newly injured, who need help, information, awareness, contacts. Um, that is a very important part of the foundation. And we're also um, very determined to support uh, and invest in transformational research. And producer Katie was telling me there's some really exciting things going on in terms of uh, bone regeneration and uh, an artificial bone to help heal uh, spinal injuries. Oh, it, it's 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 well, like like so much of medical science in almost every field, there are there are advances being made as a result of uh, you know new good good science. But absolutely, uh, we're we're making more and more progress of late than uh, has ever been made. We uh, we were. We have been very committed to uh, the study of epidural stimulation, just to give you one example, whereby when the spinal cord is injured or is cut, uh, electrical impulses implanted, you know, above and below uh, that, that break can help feed data, <laughs> information from one part from the brain 
you know, all the way down and has, has been uh, instrumental in helping any number of people regain, uh, 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 you know, temperature control, bathroom control, whatever it is. There is a lot going on. And any, uh, any university or any medical center doing particularly good work on the uh, spinal research? Yeah, I, th- I think there are, there are any number of universities in San Diego and New York um, that are involved. And, you know, the, the, and the collaborations are coming from all over the world. And it's a very it's a very collaborative uh, 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 industry, if you will, because you know people know we're getting close closer to making, and we do now to making a big difference for those that are injured that now have spinal cord injury, you know spinal cord damage. Well, John, you've you've uh, you've led an amazing life professionally, personally. I know you and Marie have three children. Uh, what kind of careers are they pursuing? We have we have two boys. Uh, both of my sons, Jesse and Jason, uh, live in Los Angeles. Um, Jesse, uh, he works for the Dodgers. I know you're a you're a bit of a baseball fan uh, with the yeah. with the with the Mets. So he's now the uh, director of marketing. Uh, he's the director of branding and marketing for the Dodgers. Wow, um, what a big opportunity that is, huh? Yeah, he, uh, he loves it. He joined in February. He's doing great. Uh, he's working with a very old friend, uh, sportscaster for the Dodgers, Charlie Steiner, who we knew. Sure. Uh, in fact, we love showing Jesse the baby present that Charlie gave to him back 36 years ago when he, when he <laughs> was born. Um, so he's the older one. Five years younger is Jason, who's 31. He's the vice president of development at uh, Paramount and uh, Nickelodeon Studios, and he's a very busy mo- mo- uh, movie executive. He has a lot of great projects, and and the beauty is they both live about three minutes away from one another in uh, in Echo Park in uh, in Los Angeles. So that's terrific. The only thing that would be better is if they, have, if they were three minutes away from you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they like the beaches here, so they come see us often. <laughs> that's great. Uh, with your sons both being in the entertainment industry of sorts, uh, tell us, a uh, young person who uh, uh, graduating from uh, Central Florida University, uh, coming to visit his folks in uh, in uh, Vero Beach, and happens to sit next to you at uh, uh, putting on his shoes to go for a bike ride. You get in the conversation. What are you telling him to think about career wise? Um, I think. Um the first thing that I tell uh, younger people, and um, I actually tell this to you know earlier today, I worked with some uh, some newbie lawyers. <laughs> um, uh, and we talked about negotiation, and we talked about um, uh, how to how to present points of view and all. Um, the first thing I I tell people is. You surely better know how to stand up when somebody walks into the room. Into a room, you better know how to shake hands with somebody and look them straight in the eye. You need to know how to say please and thank you, and you need to do it with respect, because there are a lot of young people that are in your position, and everybody's looking for an in, and everybody's looking for a way to to get through the door. It's those young people that, that respect the decision makers. Uh, those are the ones that get a second ch- chance. So that's number one. Number two, I tell them, you need to live your professional life. Heck, you need to live your, per- your personal life with one coda. Or, well, there are probably two or three, but one in particular. You do unto others as you will have them do unto you. You treat people that you work with at your level, below you and above you, the way that you want to or you expect to be treated. That's probably first. The the second thing is you have to be trustworthy. You have to be a person of your word because if you're not, that will get around. And and, and it 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 is it it's not an obvious path forward. 
And that's how I, that's how I talk to them about, about how to be and what to think and, 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 and sort of how to, how to present. But in terms of, uh, in terms of professional pursuit, I mean, there are any number of ways and things I would probably tell them about consumption of, you know, of, uh, of materials and books and information, you know, in the area that they're interested in, you know, how to, how to get in touch with people, how to network. My kids are where they are, not because of anything I had to do for them, because they knew how to network and they knew how to keep in touch and follow up and live by the code. There you, go. there you go. Well, John, you certainly in your career have uh, uh, put your money where your mouth is and live by the code from what I've come to know. And I uh, was so appreciative of sharing your story with us today, telling us all about all the interesting things that are going on in the world of uh, spinal injury treatment and uh, sharing your story about your, your own family. It, uh, there's so many people who can learn from you. And I, I think my understanding is they do all the time. And now we get to take it to an even broader audience. So, John, thanks for being so generous with your story and with your time with us. It's been a treat to get to know you. And, and you. Nice to see you. See you soon, I hope. Keep those personalities coming on the airwaves. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.